Joe Whitaker speaking. Okay, so I'm here today with Joe Whitaker. Veterans Day is this week, and I just wanted to do something uh, meaningful and exciting for our community. And so today we're just going to have a conversation about his life and his service for our country. So, Joe, I'm glad you are participating. Thank you for volunteering to do this for me. So, just um, I've talked with you a little bit about where you're from and your very young life. So would you just share that uh, to, to, to the audience? I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I was born in Prairie County, a little creek called Big Creek, Whitaker Park, and uh, that was back in 1939. Uh, I grew up in Prairie County. Uh, until my dad got killed, I was, I, I, at that time, my mom, she was, uh, she had 10 kids. My dad was a subsistence farmer. He sold items he farmed with to make us a living. But anyway, uh, it happened. The Lord took my father away when I was uh, six years old. My mom was pregnant with 10 children or excuse me, had 10 children and was pregnant with the 11th one, my yeah. baby sister. And uh, took my father away and uh, he had an accident and I had a very rough life. Mom, I'm sure had the rough, roughest life any woman could ever have, but we moved over to Leslie County when I was a six year old boy. One of my fondest memories of a six year old boy is trying to, I wanted to live good life and I wanted to please my father and show him how smart I was but I never got that chance yeah. so uh, anyway we moved to Leslie County my mom was depending on my grandfather a lot to help us out but anyway she met my, uh, my stepfather and had four more children so at 17 years old, it's sort of crowded at home. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my oldest brother, he went in the Air Force when he was 17 years old too. Mm -hmm. And he was my, sort of like my idol. And uh, anyway, I was junior in high school and uh, I was trying to help out as much as I can, greasing old trucks, putting up with the truck drivers and I just got tired of that and I didn't like school that much because of sports. I was interested in sports and pretty good in sports, but I think there was a lot of bias in the sports, you know, so I decided I'd just, you know, go my own way and went, went, in, uh, went to the Navy recruiter when I was 17 years old and uh, they told me, well, why don't you finish high school? I said, I'd rather just go right on in if I can to the Air Force. And that would have been about 1956 or seven? 1957. And okay. uh, they wanted me to go back and finish school. I said, no, I want to go into, you know, go into service. I want to take care of myself. So uh, I went from the Air Force recruiter down to the Navy and they gave me a test. They said, well, we'll, we'll take you in. And uh, went to see my mom, you know, she had to sign me in as a kitty cruiser. That's what the Navy called it, a kitty cruiser. Is that because you were 17? 17. Yeah. And not able to, you know, I guess to make my own decisions, mm -hmm. they thought. But anyway, uh, she wouldn't sign me in. So I said, Mom, if you don't, I'm going to sign myself in. Sign your name. So she went ahead and, <laughs> she went ahead and signed me in. And uh, from there, uh, it's just, uh, really a nice story because the Navy put me uh, on a ship that was uh, it was a service force ship. There was two kinds of ships in the Navy, combatants and service force ships. Mm -hmm. So my 24 years in the Navy, I was on the service force ships. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first ship was on a, uh, the USS Tenebula and what we did was carry groceries to the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. And we went over three times a year. 
I got to see a lot of ports. Yeah. France, Germany, Italy, Greece, England, about every European mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, when it turned 21, I was discharged. And at that time, our country was really in a bad situation. And uh, I went to... What was going on in our country at that time? Do you remember? Uh, it was a difficult time for to get a job. I mean, we were going through like a, really a mini depression, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, General Motors and large companies up north, well, they were laying off people that had like 10, 15 years seniority yeah. in order just to keep going. And uh, I never had a car, you know, I couldn't afford a car. But I went north with my uncle and my brother, and they, they had experience. And they had, they could get a job, but my Navy background didn't give me the experience unless, you know, I wanted to run, go on a tugboat down in Louisville, Kentucky or somewhere like that. Yeah. But uh, I put in applications for different jobs. I actually lied a little bit on some of the applications, but uh, I never did get a call. So at that time, the Navy would let you back in the Navy with the rank that you had when you got out, you know, from your previous previous enlistment. So I waited till about two weeks before <laughs> that, that was up and uh, I went back in the Navy in early 1961. Mm -hmm. And I, my first assignment was uh, USS Francis Murray and it carried uh, eight 1,500 combat equipped troops wow. with tanks, Housers, rifles, and uh, living on a ship's craft anyway. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that, just a ship, 1,500 Marines, plus about 400 sailors. And we had all these boats to haul these tanks ashore and put the Marines ashore. So I spent five years, real good years, on that ship. And uh, Before I went, excuse me now, I, I'm, I'm forgetting this a little bit. Okay. Hmm. It wasn't the Francis Murray, I, I, it was the USS Nitro. Okay. It was an ammunition ship mm -hmm. after I went into the Navy. Mm -hmm. and I commissioned it. I've got what they call a plank on it, a uh, cap. Was it a new ship at the a time? Brand new brand ship. Brand new, and you were one of the first it people. It was the first on. ship that I'd been on. I, or the, you know, it had air conditioning. Uh huh. And that was really a relief. It's the only ship that had a little bunk, you know, with a little air conditioner coming out, and you sort all your clothes underneath the bunk. And uh, prior to that, being on the older ship, the Neville, like we had racks, what they call racks, bunks. Mm -hmm. Had a mattress on it. You try set mattress up. There's three in a three in a in a, in a, in a, in a section. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, it was nice to be on a new ship. But anyway, on, after I got off the nitro, I went to golly, I thought I, I should remember well because I went to uh, hmm, well, it's Francis Murray five years, then after the Francis Marion, five years on board there, I went uh, I went to a tugboat up in uh, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was called Kittery, Maine. And I pushed, I didn't push them, but I pulled around submarines, nuclear power submarines. And I'd been that for a couple of years. And that was very exciting because we worked on the Piscataqua River you had a 10 knot current, and we had to pull a submarine to move it around to the docks and everything. You had to pull it with a large rope. And if the pilot didn't do it exactly in between high and low tides, that meant the current would take that submarine and just push it where it wanted to. And uh, it's pretty exciting when you pop it a eight inch 
inch billow braid nylon line and hooked off <laughs> like a shotgun. <laughs> and you had to have line. You had seen it all. Oh, it's okay. So uh, anyway, that was when I was an E6 in the Navy. And uh, I was doing a real world up there and they, they suggested that I go for a warrant officer program. Well, in between, I, I did that, and in between uh, being selected as a warrant officer, I made a chief petty officer. Mm -hmm. And I didn't check at that time, and I still don't know, but they, they, sang, they claimed I was probably the youngest chief boatswain mate in the Navy. Mm -hmm. But what a boatswain mate does, he does all kinds of work. He's in charge of most of the men on the ship to do all the maintenance, the painting and the running the boats. But one of the things that I did was I'd pass the word, you know. So that's how you got their attention? That's why that's that's why I have this right here. That's, that's I see. Rather around the neck. And I'm proud of it. Uh-huh. But anyway, uh, I, in between going, going, making warrant officer, being assigned as warrant officer, I went chief petty officer. And this is warrant officer's uh, shoulder boards. Mm -hmm. That's chief W-4 warrant officer. So this is off of your... Oh yes, that's, that's what I retired as. And yep. I'm really proud of that. But I went to... Uh, an old fleet order and when they made me a young warrant officer and I was about 32 years old and I got my baptism in fire. Uh, they wanted to send me to uh, Vietnam at that time. Mm -hmm. We were still involved in Vietnam and make me the waterfront officer over in Cat Low, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But uh, the man I was supposed to relieve over there, he must have had a good thing going because he volunteered to extend his crew. Mm -hmm. So that gave me a chance not to go. So I, mm -hmm. they put me on the USS Chuckawan, an old fleet order that carried seven million gallons of fuel oil. And it was an old rust bucket. And while I was on board there about four years, we, we had all kinds of accidents. <laughs> and. Then, you asked me about the scariest time I was ever. Yeah, so so I was wondering, what was your worst day? My in worst the day, and it can be proven by looking at the internet and finding a USS John F. Kennedy, an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. uh, on board a carrier, they have planes that uh, burn JP5 fuel. It's like diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. Then they have the prop propeller planes that burn uh, aviation gasoline. Well, I was the first division officer on the USS Chuckawan, and we had the, an old, old World War II fueling rig that was that was controlled by hand ro ropes around a winch, what they call a donkey winch, mm -hmm. nylon three-inch nylon rope, and uh, if you can imagine a gas hose, 300 foot long, seven inches wide, and 125 pounds of pressure through that, that's what we used to fuel the aircraft carrier with that aviation gasoline. Well, when I asked them about that rig when I first went aboard, they said, we never have used it. So. The USS John F. Kennedy was on its way to Guantanamo Bay, and we were heading north, and had an admiral on board, he, Kennedy, so he is the boss. He said, well, let's see if there, we can give these sailors, a, you know, a chance to see what they can do, you know, and anyway, we hooked up. We finally got that rig hooked up. We spent a big old span wire across there, and then uh, they started pulling the hoses across. And it, we were at, at uh, right off of Cape Hatteras, where the ocean comes right up to the 
It just comes right up to the land. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got different currents. And the seas are seem like they're always rough. But anyway, it was too rough for us to do what we was trying to do. Yeah. Because you've got a aircraft carrier about 1,000 feet long, over 100 feet wide, about 80,000 tons. And my ship, we had was carrying about six million gallons of fuel oil, and it's, mm -hmm. a, it's about 40,000 tons. And two monsters out there going 12 miles an hour or over mm -hmm. through, the, through the water. That's dangerous enough. But anyway, the ship starts separating, and we went all the way out to the length of that 300 foot cable, and we just got through pumping some gas through there. And we had just cleared the lines with uh, CO2, with a big old bank of CO2. We blew the ga aviation glass through the line, you know, to clear it completely. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ship separated, and the boom that was holding that thing came down. And all that was just dragging behind the ship. And there was, luckily, Lord thank you for saving us, but there was no sparks. And uh, so the fuel was going into the ocean. We pumped the fuel to just a little token amount of fuel to the mm -hmm. aircraft carrier, then charged that CO two through the hose oh. to clear it. Yeah. And just as we'd done that, the boom came down. And they like to never got the saran wire, you know, the steel cable tripped that that hose was hanging off of. And finally, they got it tripped and it just. On right back on. Of course, it uh, started right back as the ship, you know, was pulling at that head. And we finally, after I worked, well, after praying, I'm sure everybody on the ship was praying at that time that we didn't get blown out of the water. But anyway, uh, I worked all night. And uh, after I realized that we hadn't, we hadn't been blown up. And uh, I worked all night, and we finally got the hose back up on the, the ship, you know, and the boom yeah. up after rigging a lot of blocks. And uh, and I've never asked a man to do anything that I wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. and that's one reason I got by real well, and, I, and they drank real fast. Well, that's the quality of a great leader. And anyway, uh, I ruined my khaki pants, you know, climbing the mats and carrying blocks and things like that. But after all night, we finally got it up. And there's a big two inch shackle that was holding all that boom and everything up. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but I guess in World War II, they had shackles in two parts, like a big shackle pin. And they'd ground one of the ends off to a point and then gum them together and then they'd fill out all those wells yeah. to make the shackle. They didn't have, I guess, a forge at that time. Mm -hmm. So that shackle, they hadn't ground it all the way down. Mm. So I carried that over to the uh, fleet headquarters and showed that to the desk sergeant, not the desk sergeant, but the people in charge of the money. And they grounded all the ships, you know, that had that rig. And luckily, mm -hmm. uh, that I'm still here, yeah. thank the Lord, because yeah. we could have been blown out of the water. And uh, but anyway, that was one of my worst times. I'm curious because on a few occasions sitting here, you've mentioned, and I prayed, and I believe everybody on the ship was praying. Yes, I do. So how important was God and your faith while you were serving? Uh, if you can imagine a, a young, very young Navy man, you know, with his peers out there, he wanted me out trying to outdo the other, you know. We'd go ashore and have a good time, a good party, drinking beer, and uh, having a good time. And we didn't give God much attention until, like on Sundays, mm -hmm. uh, if we wanted church services, most most of the Navy ships that you operated with, you could, uh, you had some way of, uh, if, uh, if a chaplain was available mm -hmm. within a squadron or whoever you was operating with, they would drop off like a, a, a chaplain by helicopter. Mm -hmm. 
down onto this ship. Uh, sometimes they would drop them off, hoist them right down with the cable. Yeah. But it, there was a Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, yeah. but sometimes we'd have services. Yeah. But I would think of them at that time, and uh, not many people know this, but there's only one situation where the American flag is lower than the other flag. And that's when the ship is having services. Yeah. They hoist the pennant up for a church service above the American flag. Uh, and, I've never uh, heard that. Well, that's, so. that's a fact. Yeah. And uh, I'm very proud of the flag. Yeah. What does the flag mean to you today? Uh, because I noticed just and, glancing in your room. As a military man, it denotes all the pride and the joy that I've had in my life because uh, it, it served as an opportunity. I mean, I know if I didn't have had the freedom, an opportunity to be what I wanted to do, uh, it was all because of that flag. Yeah. And men like General Purdy, General Patton, General MacArthur, and all the admirals from the fleet, and all the sailors, and men and women, nurses, soldiers, all, especially in Europe, mm -hmm. during World War One, World War Two, Korea. I mean, there's just so many wars, and yeah. but the flag. You know, it was, it was all, all, it existed through all that. Yeah. And that was the main drive. Uh, every day when I was in service on a base or on a ship, at eight o'clock in the morning, we, we raised that flag. Mm -hmm. And every evening, ceremoniously we lowered that flag. Now I've done that for over 23 years mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a part of me that nobody could ever take away. Yeah. And uh, when I see people like football players, basketball players in our own state of Kentucky, basketball team take a knee to the flag, I could cry. Mm -hmm. And I could also get my anger mm -hmm. other ways, but I won't. Yeah. Um, I've heard friends of mine call it, well, it's just a rag. I said, no, it's more than a rag. Yeah. And uh, so it means a lot. Yeah. You talked about your scariest day, I guess. You, what was your very best day? Did you have just a day that just sticks out in your mind? This is just the greatest thing about serving, or was there a great day that sticks in your mind? There's so many great days, especially on days when I was promoted, you know, to the next rank, because it's something to work for. Yeah. And I probably shouldn't enter in my, my marriages, but I was married several times. <laughs> uh, my greatest day would be birth of my two boys. Uh -huh. And one of the worst times about having boys and being 8,000 miles away, somewhere off of Greece or somewhere like that, worrying about how in the world would I do if something happened to them. Yeah. And uh, that was one of my biggest worries. Yeah. But, uh, I really loved the Navy, and I knew I could go as far as I was able to, you know, because mm -hmm. it would depend on your ambition, mm -hmm. and uh, if you wanted to take make a take authority, you know, mm -hmm. I was uh, qualified as a W four warrant officer for command at sea. If it was actually something that happened to the captain, I could have been been you know. Mm -hmm in charge of that ship. Mm -hmm. 
when the report uh, did have like four different sections, you know, of duty, three to four, which how the school was split up. And each one of those sections were required to be able to take that shift out to sea in case of bad weather or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was an officer in charge, what they call command duty officer. That was one of my fondest jobs, really, mm -hmm. being the boss on a ship. <laughs> I got to inspect the mess hall, and all the sailors made sure they squared away. And, you know, we had a good, uh, good, a good crew. Yeah. You, you made a mention of, I never ask my crew to do anything I wasn't willing to do myself. I sure would. So I want to ask you this about leadership. In your mind, what makes a great leader? Just what I said about not asking, and, and also being all right to be excited about something, but being mature enough to know that can't lose your your balance, your sense of balance, and 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 and, and, and uh, seeing through it, mm -hmm. and being courageous enough to do what you can, but to go mm -hmm. at it, you know, and and, and and not be afraid of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, knowing that, you know, I, I wish I wish I'd have been a Christian, you know. In a way, I probably was, you know, because I, there's other times I prayed when I was a young sailor, going through a hurricane, mm -hmm. winds blowing 86 mile an hour, and you couldn't walk outside the ship unless you had a lifeline or a life jacket mm -hmm. on, and the ship turning, and you thinking, uh, as an 18-year-old sailor, I thought we were going to turn over one time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was scared within an inch of my life, and of course everybody else was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so bad that the generators underneath the ship where they take in the water to cool the generators, they lost suction, sea suction, because the ship had turned over so much, about 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. And all electric power went off. And that let, we lost our steering. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, turn the ship into a, a, a trough, and it was really bad, and we, we finally, they were what they call emergency generator. It kicked on, and we got power back to our steering, and got back straight, but mm -hmm. when you're 18 years old and things like that happen, you, 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 you learn to pray. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, so you said, how did you say that, I wish I had been a Christian back then? I could have helped more of my fellow sail sailors, you know, yeah. uh, instead of... I think it's good to know, though, that whether people know God intimately at a young age, when you get in trouble, there's a sense I can, there's somebody I can pray to. Mm -hmm. So are you a Christian now? Yeah. Are you a Christian now? Praise the Lord, yes. Yeah. Awesome. So how did that happen? I had a very young, well, she was a very close friend in Lester County named Elvin Pace. Uh, when I got out of the Navy, I, I started building houses. And that's something I, one of my loves in life was mm -hmm. being a carpenter and mm -hmm. also built furniture. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I was on Rock House Creek in Lester County and uh, I, uh, when I first got out, I needed furniture and a place to live. And the bank at that time, even though the military would have uh, given him a 75 cent assurance of, of loan, on, on the loan, they would not even loan me $1,400. Mm. And I had an income like $1,000 a month or over, you know. But anyway, I, I, I had to get this apartment to live in, and Evelyn mm -hmm. Pace and her sisters run a furniture store. Mm -hmm. So they gave me credit to buy an outfit, a bedroom outfit, and things like that. And uh, anyway, I got to know her that way, and also I got to know her sister. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, she bought me a Bible in 1994, Christmas, oh, wow. and invited me to church. And uh, I didn't know at that time, but the church had, had me on their prayer list. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I, she bought me the Bible, and I'd been by myself working and building houses. I'd built about four or five houses by that time and never paid no attention to hardly anybody. I was mm -hmm. actually a recluse in a way because mm -hmm. I built the houses all by myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally went to church and got to knowing some of the people. And uh, one night, I was watching Billy Graham on a Saturday night, 1995, February. And uh, he was so plain spoken about God and Jesus. And uh, I just felt that was my heart for it was time. Mm -hmm. So I got down on my room. Floor and right in front of that TV. And asked the Lord to save me. It's a wonderful story. What a wonderful story. Well, next Sunday, next morning, I had to go to church mm -hmm. and tell them about it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been it's been a good life ever since. Well, it's been a good life altogether, yeah. except you know missing my dad. Mm -hmm. I loved my stepfather, but he wasn't always placing my dad. Sure. Yes. And. Uh, leadership part uh, that comes from God mm -hmm. you're either a follower or a leader yeah. I didn't want to be a follower mm -hmm. so I have a real good retirement good health insurance and uh, the way I got to be into this place was because of my military service and you know and health I've got a service disability mm -hmm. for my back mm -hmm. and for my hearing. Mm -hmm. So we're here at Carnaby Square Apartments where mm -hmm. you live. Yes. And <clears throat> I met you last Thursday. Yes. Uh, and I thought, okay, so this is a guy with a story, and on especially about Veterans Day. So what would you say to young men today about the military and about serving in the military? What what would you say to them today? Uh, I would say to them, if uh, they really want a career to excel, to be their best, without a lot of pressure, but they have to have ambition, mm -hmm. and I'm talking to men and women, mm -hmm because I was on the first ship in the Navy and had women on it. Yeah. And uh, if they really want to excel and work and put forth some effort, and the Navy will, will educate you, Army will too, mm -hmm. but it's the best career anyone could ever hope for. Yeah. Uh, my idea when I was, uh, Oh, back and, and back in 1967, when I was a chief petty officer up in New Hampshire, running a tugboat, I wanted to be the first enlisted man to command a ship, mm -hmm. and I was going to college courses. And uh, in between that and uh, running a tugboat, but uh, I just wasn't I just wasn't smart enough in math. I just tried the best I could, but I just couldn't get, I just couldn't get math that good. Uh -huh. And uh, I only got about two years college, uh -huh. but that was enough. The Navy wanted to make me a warrant officer. Uh -huh. And uh, if I'd had a college education, I, I could have been a real, uh, a real senior officer. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, being a warrant officer W-4 was really a senior officer in a way because I, I trained a lot of junior officers uh -huh. in the Navy yeah. uh, on 
you know, watch on how to how to stand watch on a ship. What what do you think? <clears throat> so you fought for our country and I didn't you, fight any, honey. I, well, I mean, you served our country. I served our country, which helped uh, those who were actually but fighting. And I served the sailors that did fight for our exactly. country. Exactly. Exactly. There's times I thought we'd have to fight, even though we didn't have anything to fight with. Mm -hmm. uh, like being up in the North Atlantic, trying to chase an aircraft carrier down to give it some fuel, mm -hmm. and some Russian destroyer come up from the rear end of our ship doing about 40 miles an hour, mm -hmm. and all you could do was at 15 miles an hour flat out. All we had to fight with was chipping hammers and potatoes I mean <laughs> because all we had was fuel and that oh. Russian destroyer just coming right beside of us and this is something nobody knows but anyway them cycling our missiles mm -hmm. up and down telling us where we could go and heading right off our bow mm -hmm. about 40 miles an hour I mean we would have fought them but we, they could have blown us out of the Navy nobody else in the world probably knows about it yeah. So we, I've been close to battle, but yeah. not like not actual combat. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that when you hold your hand up, that's something you accept. Yeah. To give your life for your country. Yeah. And that's something any young man or woman they would have to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's about the same as any of our services, you know, or sure. our police force or first responders. Mm -hmm. I admire them all. Yeah. Yeah. And Everybody's serving somebody, you know. That's, that's the way our world is. It's and the I way our that's world the way God is. Intended it. Find a place to serve somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's important. It's more important for me to give than it is to get. Yeah. And that's one of the best blessings I've experienced in life. Yeah. Well, so, is there anything else before I end that you just really would like the world to know about yourself? Not really about me, but about our country. Yeah. Uh, I'm really worried that we're going downhill and that we don't have leadership mm -hmm. in our government. Yeah. That's thinking about our country and the future. I worry about China. Anyone that has a resilience to take 1,000 years to build a rock wall around their country, they have the patience to wait us out. And uh, I worry about our education, that we don't have history taught anymore. Mm -hmm. Kids don't know where they're coming from. They don't even know where they're girls or boys. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a, God tells me not to worry. Mm -hmm. He's in charge, and I know he is. Yeah. But how can we not worry, though? I mean, we have people around us. And uh, they just aren't, they just not, have no guidance, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> one reason why it's important to me to capture these stories is because I can put these on the internet and people can see these stories and hear your life experience and know where the history comes from and why we have the freedom that we enjoy. And so uh, it's just a goal to be able to talk to our seniors, people who are, who have, I want to talk to somebody a little wiser than me every single day of my life because I think that's super important. That's great. So I appreciate the time that you've given to be here today, to to share your story and I just wanted to say this week because it is Veterans Day coming up on Thursday that I'm really thankful You're for welcome. what you've done and uh, how you've served and for sharing your story with us. So thanks uh, to all those who will listen and um, until we see you again just keep living and just keep serving. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs>